I barely recognize you, Colonel. Skullface used your thirst for revenge against Big Boss, did he? some new job offers. The details are on your iDroid. Volgan, the Gru Colonel, was burned alive with a Shagoha during Operation Snake Eater 20 years ago. Despite suffering severe burns to his entire body, he still clung to life. After you left Seliniarsk, Volgan's body was taken to a research institute in the outskirts of Moscow. But modern medicine couldn't explain why he was still alive. Not that the Colonel was any ordinary man to begin with. That constant electric current he had running through his body that he could unleash at will? To be honest, I was always uncomfortable around him. Thought I might get electrocuted just by standing nearby. The Institute studying him was tasked with investigating and developing human paranormal abilities. The comatose Volgan was used to further the Soviet Union's research into such abilities. But not long ago, the facility burned to the ground. And Volgan's body was never found among the rubble, even though the fire started in the room where they were keeping him. This occurred at around the same time you woke up. If Skullface was right, and a thirst for revenge can turn a man into a demon and keep the dead alive, and this man on fire who's been coming after us ever since you woke up? Well, that just might be what's left of our old friend, Volgan. It's not over yet. Back in 64, in Seleniarsk, you brought his plans for a utopia down in flames. That grudge is what's keeping him alive. The day the research facility holding Volgan burned down, a Soviet jumbo passenger jet happened to crash nearby, far away to the north of that hospital in Cyprus. On board the plane was a young boy who was being studied at the same facility. The plane fell to Earth from over 8,000 feet, but the boy's body was the only one not recovered. At almost exactly the same time as the crash, Volgan awoke in that facility. According to the Research Institute's documents, the gifts this boy demonstrated included psychokinesis and telepathy. To protect his mind from being inundated with other people's thoughts, he always wore a kind of gas mask. A rudimentary form of psychic insulation, apparently. We don't know where this boy is, but if Skullface is connected to him, we may cross paths with him yet. This boy is part of a new age, where nothing we understand about the world makes sense anymore. Don't let your guard down. A ruler's greatest wealth is not money or land. It is the number of individuals under his control. Subjects who work, consume, are there to be used as pawns in war. For a capitalist ruler, his people's power becomes his power. You are the same with your diamond dogs. You spin it with your speeches. But what you're doing is bringing as much talent as you can into your little domain. Every person another feather in your cap. Yes. Since ancient times, every civilization's ruler has had the same idea. When people unite under one will, they become stronger than the sum of their parts. And the one will is the ruler's will. And what do rulers use to bring people together? Language. In the Old Testament, it is written that only one language was spoken in Eden. A shared tongue that united all of humanity. Mankind eventually grew aware of its power and harnessed that strength to build a tower to the heavens. The mighty Tower of Babel. This angered God, who splintered the language of man, and the tower was never completed. Languages emerged and the earth was divided as men went their separate ways. 
Every age is the same. A ruler's first order of business after conquering new land is to Caution. force his tongue Ooh, on its people. Ancient Rome, Napoleon, and now Zero. English is wrecking havoc around the world right now. The British Empire tilled the land with war as its hoe, then began planting the seed that is English. Eventually, American capitalism became the new instrument. To play its game of wealth, you only had to abide by one rule, English. By exploiting people's desires, English has become a leash that people gladly wear around their necks, it would seem. So what were they doing at Enzoya Badia, Baloo? That facility with all the people laid out in rows. The abandoned factory Shibani was held in. It is precisely as you guessed. Black Anna was coding languages into the vocal cord parasites. They infected the subjects with the parasites, then made an incision in the throat to expose the vocal cords. That allowed them to play recordings of a desired language directly to the parasites. And the parasites learn the languages that way. That's some teaching method. I just don't get how a bunch of bugs had the brain power for it. They don't. Do not judge them by human standards. They do not learn as a function of intellect. Then how do they do it? What language the parasites react to is coded into their genes. You could expose the Japanese strain to English for years, and it would never learn the language and react to it. The pronunciation, rhythm, and structure are different. But what about, say, Spanish and Portuguese? Linguistically, the two are very close. Yeah, they're both Ibero-Romance languages. Even so, a Spanish language mating pair exposed to Portuguese will not copulate. Only when they hear Spanish. Only then. And the majority of their offspring will be the same. So it's a literal case of a mother tongue. But if that's so, I don't see how the different strains can be created in the first place. Well... Among the many thousands of offspring, there may be just a few that react to Portuguese. You're talking about mutations. Correct. Playing the tapes helps to identify the mutant strains. Those specimens are then isolated and bred with one another. From their children, specimens that react more strongly to Portuguese can again be selected and bred. Repeating this process creates a strain that reacts solely to Portuguese and never to Spanish. Mutation and selection. No different to breeding roses. So you kept increasing the change over the generations, adapting them to languages from all over the world. You must have taken a hell of a lot of patience. More like patience. Just how many died for this? There's something I still don't get. In order to tell which larvae will react to Portuguese, you'd have to let them develop and then see which copulate. That means you'd need tens of thousands of guinea pigs. There's no way you could do that in a facility that small. For normal selective breeding methods, you would be right. But there is a more effective selection method when training the vocal cord parasites. <sighs> Go on. It is not only when mating that the parasites listen for language. Shortly before hatching, larvae display markedly increased activity in reaction to a particular language. The active eggs can be identified under a black light. So the eggs that react to Portuguese are selectively placed in the throats of subjects. So you see, Narrowing down strains that react to the target language is an effective process. Though I'm sure that even so, many lost their lives to create the various strains. Taken against their will into that... that dungeon. 
There are two reasons for playing the tapes for the parasites. One, to isolate the eggs that respond to the target language. And two, to cause the specimens raised from the selected eggs to mate. I get how the system works. But why do they respond to language before they even hatch? It's not like they can mate from inside an egg. It is because the larvae learn the language before hatching. You mentioned that what language the parasites respond to is hard-coded into their genes, and that they don't have the brain power to actually learn a language. But then you say that the larvae at Nzoyabadia Bulu were learning the languages in the egg. Your story doesn't add up. Your country is home to a unique songbird. The Japanese bush warbler. Sure, what of it? What a beautiful call it has. But no bush warbler can sing it perfectly at the start. As chicks, they can barely chirp at all. They must learn from their parents and other adult birds. Only then can they sing properly and attract females. So naturally, there are individual differences in each bird's call. Though they start on the same footing, each bird is influenced by its teachers. And the parasites are the same? Like the birds, the parasites have a genetic predisposition towards a particular language. But while in the egg, the larvae's ears are tweaked by listening to the voice of the host. This tweaking ensures that the grown parasites will react better to the host's speech pattern. Why would they have an ability like that? Well, there are distinct regional differences within even the same language. Rare is the language that has no unique dialects. Yes, learning the host's speech pattern before hatching attunes the larvae to whatever twist of pronunciation it will encounter. This adaptive ability is what makes them so formidable. I see. So a language requires selective breeding, but the parasites can learn dialects by themselves. Of course, having the egg stage larvae listen to the tapes in the factory was not meant to teach them. It was more important to use that trait of theirs to identify the mutated strains. As I mentioned earlier, is that really accurate enough to use as a weapon? You could wipe out a neighboring ethnic group by accident if their pronunciation is too close. What you say is true. In that sense, they are imperfect as ethnic cleansers. But for his purposes, they are good enough. His objective was not to exterminate any one ethnic group, but to render the world's lingua franca, English, inert.